What is your aim in life? Philippians 1.21. What is your aim in life? I preached sermons like this before, but I thought it'd be a good time again to bring up some of the thoughts. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. What can that mean to me, preacher? That don't make sense. For me to live is Christ. For me to die is gain. Preacher, that don't make any sense to me. What drives you in life? What drives you in life? Is it Christ that drives you in life? Would you rather live and serve Christ or would you rather die? And then, and then think for some reason it could even be better. Well, it would be. For a Christian to leave their body, it's gain. What causes you to do the very things that you do, church? When you open your mouth, the thoughts you have in private, in your closet, in your bedroom, what drives you, what motivates you? We're going to talk about that. I hope it's to live in Christ so that you can, when you die, have gain. What we see as important has become more obvious in the last few weeks. Politics dominate the mind and hearts of so many. Is it dominating my mind and my heart? Is that all that ever comes across my mind and my thought and my, my, my words is, is politics? Give you something much more important than that. You look around you here. You know what you have? You have precious souls that, and there's not one soul in this building that will not live forever and ever and ever and ever, either in hell or in heaven. Everybody's soul is so important. My soul should be as important to you as yours is to you. And your soul should be as important to me as mine is to me. Paul was incredibly open and honest about his life. What drove him to live the way he did? Honesty is the best policy. Paul, you need to explain it to us. Is Christ your life? Is Christ my life? Let me answer that really. John, right here in front of all these witnesses, is He the number one thing in your thought, in your heart, and in your life? Do you have everything in your life revolving around Christ? Well, I want to. It's not what I ask you. Do you? Well, I tried to. Do you? Not as much as I should. Thank you for the answer. Paul's motto was to know Christ Jesus and live for Him. I want you to turn to Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 through 11. But what things were gained to me, Paul says, these I have counted loss for Christ. Paul had lost all of his honor as a Roman soldier, as a Roman citizen. He had a lot to give up. He, he lost it all. Would I be willing to lose every physical blessing I have for my soul to go to heaven? Well, I might. If I was in hell right now, my answer would be absolutely give me another chance. I will. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain in Christ. All the unbelievable, yeah. prestigious things Paul had in his life he had lost, and he counted that as pure garbage compared to what he had found in Christ. And he found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith that I may know Him in the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings. The fellowship of His sufferings. We suffer as Christians sometimes as well. Being conformed to His death. 
Being conformed to his death, yes. You know, when a Christian died into the old man of sin in the watery grave of baptism, he was raised a new creature when he came out. All his sins have been washed away. He'd been added to the church for the Lord himself. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. No matter how much I lose here, what I'm going for is when I'm resurrected from the dead that I'm going to heaven. And I'm going to carry as many people with me as I can. And that is definitely gain. So do I want to stay here and keep working? Yes. Do I keep want to, want to try to live as a Christian and bring others to Christ? Yes. Or do I want to die and go to heaven? Oh, yes. Which one's the greatest? Well, I'm motivated by both. Money on the disguise of providing for my family could go against that. I have to provide for my family. Yes, you do. If you don't, you're worse than an infidel. But it cannot dominate every thought, every breath you take. We have to work. And sometimes we can't be here. Everybody here is not blessed with an 8 to 5 job or 9 to 5 job, Monday through Friday. We need to get that. And we need to respect that. At the same time, it cannot dominate everything in your mind, your soul, and in your heart. We've got to be living for Christ. We can't let power consume us. The desire for power. We cannot let the desire for control, I know best, dominate our hearts. We cannot even let our families dominate our hearts. We have to love God more than we do our own family. That's hard, but that's what we need to do because He loves us more than that. He loved us more than His own family. He let His own family die on the cross for us. We need to love God first. Popularity cannot be that important. We all like to be popular. Accolades are like trophies with special honors. I'm this, I'm that, I'm important, I'm something else, I like pats on the back. Too many Christians spend too much of their lives living for the wrong thing. Let me give you an accolade that you will want to carry with you to the grave. When somebody's standing on your casket and you're gone, and they're looking at you, and this accolade comes out of their mouth, right there lays the person that had a whole lot to do with me finding Christ. That person right there had a whole lot to do with me preparing myself to go to heaven. Right there lies someone that I'll always love and cherish because without them I would have fell away so many times. There's so many things in my life that I grew weak over. But the person laying right there, I give them special honor. They encouraged me when I needed it. They helped me. They loved me when I needed love. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. Well, you mean I can't even love my house? You can't love your house more than you do God. You can't love your job, your car, your opportunities, or anything else more than you do God. Verse 16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. Then he who does the will of God abides forever. When Christ is in your life, brothers and sisters, you're not to be afraid to talk about it. You know, what needs to be coming out of my mouth everywhere, in elevators, escalators, in fields, in grocery stores, is talking about Christ. Paul's time was spent preaching Christ. How do we stop ourselves from bad thoughts and bad things going through our mind? From hatred, from trying to get even, or or ways to deceive. How, how, do I, how do I get those thoughts out of my mind? Overcome temptations. 
Matthew 12, 43 through 45. Remember, it speaks of if one evil spirit leaves your heart and you sweep it, make it clean, and feel good all over, and don't fill it up, that one will come back and bring seven other spirits worse than he was. And you'll be worse off than you were before. So we've got to fill our hearts full of Christ. Fill our hearts full of working for Christ, studying for Christ, praying to Christ, through Christ to God, and serving Christ in our, in our fellowships, in our church families, and our own families. After his baptism, the first thing Paul did was preach Jesus. Acts 9, 18 through 21. He was willing to preach Christ even if it meant death. Even if it meant... It. I don't think I'm going to preach tomorrow. Why? Because they said they'd come in here and kill me. You know what, you know what Paul said? Be here, I'll be here. That's what Paul said. Why would he do that? What was motivating a man to actually think that way? The love of Christ, that's what it was. The gospel did not stop spreading because Paul was in prison. In fact, even in prison, it advanced. God used Paul in prison to further the gospel. It's incredible. How could you be put in isolation, in chains, and then all of a sudden you're spreading the gospel? What motivates a man like that? Do you think Paul had his heart full of, of the Great Commission that I need to go out and try to spread the gospel? Do you think he was focused on souls? Do we think maybe Paul had realized people are not just numbers, they are souls? How many we got here today? I got a better question than that. How many people are here and their hearts, thoughts, minds, and everything about them is here as well. They want to be here. They love God. They love Christ. They want to learn more. They want to have fellowship with one another. They want to be encouraged and they want to encourage. They want to live it as a Christian. How many people are here like that? I can safely say I believe in this congregation everyone here. I don't know if it's true everywhere in the world, but I, I strongly feel it is here. Thank the good Lord too, isn't it? One day will be in heaven. All of their souls, they'll be in heaven or they'll be in hell. And maybe I can make a difference. Could that motivate me a little bit better? Would that be something in my mind that I'm thinking now? Maybe I can actually help keep somebody and get them to heaven or I can bring somebody in and give them to heaven or maybe I can teach them and get them to heaven? Hmm. Do we think maybe he, he really was motivated to encourage and guide souls? I believe Paul was. To become stronger and grow in knowledge? Can you imagine being in heaven and, and putting your arms around a brother or sister and saying, I remember you. I remember when you were so weak. And I helped you along. And all, I, I am so thrilled that I was given the opportunity to do that. To receive their crown of life I had a little part of it. Wow. We should be talking about Jesus more than the news is talking about the news. When Christ is our aim in life, you make it your aim to magnify Him. Paul's actions were about magnifying Christ. He wanted Christ to be honored in His body, whether in this life or whether in His death. There'll be many souls in here when they leave these bodies will still be teaching us. There'll be days that somebody will be standing where I'm standing right here and they'll look out there and they'll see an empty space in one of those pews. And they'll see in their mind that body that used to fill that pew. And they know where that body is. And that thought will keep them strong for a long time. I don't want to disappoint him or her. They meant a lot to me. I want to see them in heaven. We can magnify Christ in our life and in our death. Paul was not ashamed of Christ. Instead, he magnified Him in his life. 1 Peter 4, 16, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. 
When a person is in Christ, his life is supposed to be new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, and we are, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. We're that new creation. Nearly everyone in here has been baptized into Christ. We're all a new creation. You're wonderful in God's sight. You're wonderful in each other's sight. When Christ is your life, you understand death is not your enemy. Paul's mind was set on living with Christ. Paul understood living with Christ meant that his death would just be gain. I want to go to 2 Timothy and read 4, 6-8. Second Timothy 4, 6 through 8. And if you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. But reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things having promise of this life that now is and of what which is to come. This is a faithful stain and worthy of all acceptance. You know, there's nothing like studying the gospel and trying to live by it. I mean nothing. And what you need to do is turn over to second Timothy. And read that again now. Second uh, Timothy 4, 6 through 8. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering in the time of my departures at hand. I have fought the good fight. Now wait a minute. I'm laying in the coffin. I'm still alive. My spirit's still alive. Am I thinking these things? I have fought the good fight and have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. I'm laying in the coffin. My spirit has left my body. Am I thinking those things? Am I excited? Did I prepare myself? I, I hope so. The word gain is a monetary term. That means to make a profit on the investment. How we view death will affect how we live life. For the Christian, whether we live or die, we win. It's a great investment. It's a great investment. It's a great investment living as a Christian. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where the thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where the thieves cannot break in and steal. For where, there, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is also. Paul's life was about Jesus and only Jesus. Is my life only about Jesus? Is yours? What do you consider to be the aim of your life? And I could end the lesson right there. Next to the last slide. The lives... We choose to live. The life that you have chosen to live, this second, reveals what the importance is in your life. When someone looks at me, do they see Christ in my life? Do they see me working for Christ, living for Christ, acting and talking and loving like I should in Christ, or do they just see something else? I pray we choose to live for Christ. What's your aim in life? What is your aim in life? There are those right now here that have never heard the gospel. <clears throat> there are those right here, right now, <clears throat> that need to listen to what God's Word says. They need to believe every word of it, and then they need to be able to repent, change anything in their life they need to. Once they do and have a good understanding of what God's Word means, then and only then can they walk up here in this water grave of baptism 
and bury the old man of sin. Every sin you've ever committed will be gone and forgotten about. They'll be washed away. And then when you raise up, you're a brand new creature. You're a child of God. You'll be added to the church, to the kingdom of the Lord himself. That's wonderful, isn't it? The only problem is, then we have to walk the walk and talk the talk. We have to be Christians. And sometimes all of us get a little weak and we, we fall by the wayside. But when we do that as Christians, we can look and see what the aim in our life is. And if Christ is in our life and we want Him to be in our life, all we have to do is repent. If you have a need, come forward as we stand and as we sing. <laughs>